Good morning. Good morning. Oh, I just tried to wipe my nose with the shield. <laughs> All right. Oh, let us join together in the call of worship. We are God's work of art. We are God's handiwork, reborn in Christ Jesus to be a blessing. We are God's creation. Our hymn of adoration is, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Let us pray. Dear loving Father, like a moth drawn toward light, like an animal thirsting for water, we come to worship. Like a wound aching to be healed, like a crying child yearning to be held, we come to worship. Like an unemployed worker waiting for a call, like a beggar asking for bread, we come to worship. Like a prayer longing to reach heaven's gate, like a note waiting to be sung, we gather to praise your name. Lord, in these 40 days, you lead us into the desert of repentance, that in this pilgrimage of prayer, we might learn to be your people once more. In fasting and in service, you bring us back to your heart. You open our eyes to your presence in the world, and you free our hands to lead others to the radiant splendor of your mercy. Be with us in these journey days, for without you, we are lost and will perish. To you alone be dominion and glory forever and ever. In this we pray in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Psalm 107, 17 through 22. Some were sick through their sinful ways, and because of their iniquities endured affliction.
Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. Let me thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to mankind. Everybody, hello. Good morning, good morning. Good, night, every, good morning, everybody watching on YouTube. Said money. Very nice. You, you may be seated. Just a couple of announcements this morning. Uh, Easter uh, flowers ordering envelopes are on the table at the top of the stairs. We're continuing, continuing with canned tuna for our March mission. And after service, we're going to have a, a choir quickie rehearsal. And the BBS on the 21st. And the BBS on the 21st. Thank you, Michael. That's... Uh, Benevolent. Are there any uh, any prayer concerns? Okay. No. No prayer concerns. Okay. For later. No. Okay. All right. We we we, we can say well, we can uh, pray for Debbie's family. That would be fun. Gene, okay. Anyone else? I'm sorry, Emily? Oh, they have like another, like a surge, a COVID surge? Oh, oh they were so messed up the first time. Oh. Just when you thought there was light at the end of the tunnel, it turns into a train. Okay, and anyone else? Good? Okay. Then let us be in spirit of giving as we give our offerings to the Lord.
Thanks be to you, O God, for all good gifts, and especially for the inexpressible gift of the Lord Jesus. Help us, O Lord, to see where we have been blessed and to be a blessing to others. Gracious God, Jesus promised his disciples the gift of the Holy Spirit, a gift that remains as powerful and transformative today as it was back then. With generous and thankful hearts, we offer our gifts to you, our time, treasure, and talent, but most of all, our hearts. Use us in these offerings for your purposes and your glory. Amen. Our hymn of worship is Of the Father's Love Begotten. You may be seated. This morning's scripture reading is from the book of Numbers, chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. From Mount Or they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it on a pole. And whenever the serpent bit someone, that person would look to the serpent of the bronze and live. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. The account of the serpents in the wilderness is part of the second major section of the book of Numbers, which recounts the 40-year experience of wandering 
the Israelites endured following the exodus from Egypt. Today's lesson also constitutes the last of the complaint stories, a literary and theological motif that runs throughout the wilderness narrative. The basic form of the complaint story is that the people complain against and or to Moses because of the harshness of their circumstances or the perilous risks confronting them. God responds to their complaint and the people repent. In their impatience, the people spoke against God and against Moses. The only time in the complaint accounts when the Israelites complain directly against God. In the story of the people's complaining, the Israelites usually murmur or complain against Moses. In this case, the punishment for their complaint is a plague of poisonous serpents. In later Jewish and Christian tradition, this account functioned mainly as a warning tale against waywardness, although typically the Gospel of John shifts the point of the story's moral and sees in Moses' bronze serpent a prefiguration of Jesus' crucifixion and exaltation.
Let us pray. Jesus, Son of Man, Son of God, hear our prayers and graciously carry them to the Father on our behalf. On this third Sunday of Lent, we reverently recall the many titles you bear, the many ways in which you serve our Father and us. You are called Son of Man because you were born into a humble home. Son of Man, let us never be ashamed of our birth, nor despise your beloved poor. You are recognized by a few as the Son of God because of your close walk with the Father. Son of God, share with us your sense of God's reality and love. You challenge people to practice justice, to show mercy. Prophet of righteousness, sensitize us to injustice and give us courage and skill in exposing and opposing it. You offered yourself to the Father as a sacrifice to please him. O Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us and grant us your peace. You enlisted disciples and trained them strenuously. Teach us, Master, what you expect of us in your service and how we can be faithful witnesses to the gospel. You spent yourself making people whole in body and mind. Great physician, teach us to be agents of healing to the sick and ministers of comfort to the dying. And be near us, we pray, in our time of need. You protected the defenseless and stood up for the oppressed. Advocate of the weak, give us strength and persistence to follow your example of loving, caring, advocacy. The earliest creed of your church consisted of only two words, Jesus, Lord. Jesus, Lord, abide with your church through all the ages and beyond history. We are sinners prone to evil, slothful and good. Save us, gentle Savior, from ourselves and grant us daily a fresh chance and a fresh challenge. We must all pass at last into your judgment. Judge and Redeemer, in your infinite mercy, accept us into your kingdom. God, we pray that you grant your blessings upon Debbie's family. Grant your blessed blessings upon Jean and your blessings on the entire country of Italy. Now experience a resurgence of COVID-19. Holy God, center us in the journey toward the cross at the sights and sounds of Christ's journey towards Jerusalem. May we remember that we too must find our way to a new understanding of sacrifice for the sake of love for others. Lead us not into the temptation of excuses, of definitions that keep us distance from your purpose. May we come to know that quiet joy of love, burning deep within us, that calls forth a desire to give ourselves for your world, like Jesus did. Forgive us our distractions, heal our wounds. Give us courage for this journey, not only to the cross, but also beyond, to your new life for all peoples. 
Make it be so, make it be so. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Uh, one announcement before the scripture text. Uh, I got a phone call message that I heard this morning on the machine in the office from um, Sarah Weed. Was that her name? From the uh, Warren uh, Preservation Historical Society who wanted to uh, look into renting space in the Jura building. Uh, they called back to say that they have decided not to make the move at this time. They're going to stay where they are. She didn't say whether, whether that was a reason because of rent or, or whatever. She just said that they are just not ready to move. So, have you, have you, uh, sent them a rent uh, contract at that point? Yes, yes. I had talked to, uh, verbally, I talked to her on the phone, and, and she presented that presumably to the meeting they had that was supposed to have been on Wednesday, which did happen, because she mentioned that in a phone message. But uh, um, she did not say whether that was the reason. She seemed to be very clear that it was just that they're not ready to move. She may have been ready to move. She may have been the gung-ho one to, to do that, but perhaps the rest of them, of them were not ready to make a move. That should make the thrift shop happy, yes. And so every, everything... Is uh, yep, solved itself. Okay, our scripture today, take two. Our scripture text today is from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10 from death to life. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Perhaps you've heard that people have re relocated because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And it turns out there's some truth to those rumors. In July, the Pew Research Center released findings of a study it conducted, and its headline told the tale. About a fifth of the U.S. adults, about a fifth of U.S. adults moved due to COVID-19 or they know someone who did. When you drill down to, into the study's statistics, however, much of the moving sims seems to have been by young adults, a fairly mobile demographic at any time. While some moves were to flee areas with high infection risks, other moves were caused by the pandemic only indirectly. For example, a young adult might have moved back home because her college dorm closed to prevent virus spread. Or a restaurant worker moved because his job went away when eateries were forced to shut down. Nevertheless, there does seem to have been some increased migration among other adults who, for one reason or another, decided that last summer was the right time to change locations. Some moves were by people with financial resources and job flexibility to pick up and move 
to a place that was not a virus hotspot. But demographics say that people generally move for life stage reasons because of things happening internally in their lives. So some of the relocating may have had little or nothing to do with the virus. One of our homiletic uh, colleagues and his wife moved back in August for family and retirement reasons, and in the process learned that they were part of a boom. The real estate agent they contacted to sell their home said there was a housing shortage because of so many people moving or wanting to. They listed their home in late June, and the very next day, they received an offer that was $3,000 above their asking price. Why would you submit above someone's asking price? That just seems like a waste of money. But they, re they really wanted that house. It must have been a great house. So of course, they accepted the offer and had to phone several moving companies before finding out available uh, oh, before finding one available to truck their household stuff to their new location. The movers told them that booking a truck was hard right then because many more people than usual were relocating. Moves driven by the virus have skewed the numbers, but many people are still moving for the normal reasons. The major theme of our reading from Ephesians is the grace of God, but included in the text are a couple of statements about moving. Quote, even when we were dead through our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The words have an otherly, otherworldly ring to them, and if we don't stop to think about them, we may assume they are about, are about eternal life. But the death and life to which they refer is about what today we sometimes call conversion. And the movement implied in raised us up with Christ and seated us with him is moving from an earthbound perspective on life to a heaven-inspired one. And one reason we're sure that Paul was not speaking of a life after death experience here is because he concluded this passage by saying, for we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Still being seated with Jesus in heavenly places doesn't sound much like the usual experience of my daily life. How about yours? But Paul is presumably using the vaunted, langu vaunted language of exaltation to convey the idea of looking at our lives from above, from God's presence, and being motivated in our daily actions by that perspective. Ignatius of Loyola, the 16th century priest who founded the Jesuits, developed a process of spiritual discernment for Christians who wanted to learn what God intended for them. Because how do we know what God wants, right? An important principle of his process is this. The love which moves me and makes me choose something has to be descended from above, from the love of God, he wrote. To seek God will, God's will and be moved by God's love is what this verse is speaking of. The writer of 1 John speaks of this kind of motivation during using different words. He writes, God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. We love because he first loved us. We love because he first loved us. That's 1 John chapter 4. The idea of moving serves as a metaphor for this. It doesn't come naturally to most people to choose our daily activities and responses to others based on what we think God wants of us. To get there, we need to make a conscious effort, something akin to the effort required to move our household, all of our stuff, to a new place.
Consider this story about an English, um, excuse me, about a woman in Edinburgh, Scotland, so she was Scottish, not English, who lived in a dingy cellar apartment. She was a member of a congregation where minister and hymn writer George Matheson had been the pastor. Matheson had gone blind while studying for the ministry, but he continued into the ministry and became known for the power of his preaching. The practice in that church was for elders in the congregation to take communion around to members at various times of the year. But the deacon who was assigned to take the bread and cup to this woman found the cellar empty. When he tracked her down, he found her living in an attic that was as light and airy as the cellar had been dark and dingy. And he commented on the difference. He told her, I see you changed your house. She responded, I have. You can't hear Reverend Matheson preach and live in a cellar. The grace of God had elevated her view of life, like being seated in the heavenly places. We might assume that living that way would get easier as we get more in the habit of seeking and doing God's will, but that isn't necessarily the case. Our homiletics colleague has relocated several times over his career, and he tells us that the task has become more work with each successive move. The first one, when he was newly married, and they had little stuff, was accomplished using just their car in the vehicle of a friend. As children came along, so did more stuff. And now, with a lifetime accumulation of things, more effort was required, including dealing with underwriters for a mortgage, having a move-out deadline that didn't mesh with the move-in availability of the destination home, and getting a truck scheduled all around that. Those of you who have moved recently will no doubt have your own stories of the challenges involved. Anybody? No? No? Anybody moved recently? What, next time hire a moving company? I did it with a friend who brought a friend to help pick, move with pickup trucks, and that friend of a friend broke things because he was a klutz, so yeah, maybe, maybe hiring a moving company is the, the best advice, Mike. Thank you. Uh, trying to look at life from a heaven-inspired perspective, moving our viewpoint and then acting accordingly, doesn't necessarily get easier, even as we make it a regular practice. We are dragging more and more of life behind us as we move along. The joys and pleasures, the disappointments and sorrows, the doubts and worries. And the voice of God, which initially seemed to have broken to us, spoke, excuse me, spoken to us so plainly, sometimes seems inex inexplicably silent but that doesn't necessarily mean we've somehow failed, but rather God wants us to walk by faith. One of the odd things about moving this year is that if you've done so in hoping of lessening your exposure to COVID-19, the move may have been an exercise in futility. The word pandemic, of course, refers to how widespread the risk of exposure is. You can't completely run from a pandemic. Likewise, even as religious conversion or commitment to follow Jesus has moved us. In the words of our text, to be raised up with Christ and seated with him, that relocation does not ensure that we'll always have a clear word from God. Nevertheless, the love and grace of God already received compels us to goodness and to a desire to do his will. The move that Paul describes as being seated with Christ in heavenly places helps us to better please God and do the good works that God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Maybe, may we be willing to live that way. Amen.
Thought I might have had. Oops. Reminder, all choirs going to meet after service. Now to the one who, by the power at work within our lives, enable us to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. Amen.